With some let us arise, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be with all. And with thy spirit. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Let us be attentive. Glory to thee, O Lord. Glory to thee. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, where the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Glory to thee, O Lord. Glory to thee. Master who loves mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments that trampling down all carnal desires. We may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and unto thee do we ascribe glory together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thine all holy, good, and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Good morning. Today is the Sunday of Thomas. And you always hear don't be a doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. Right, Tom? You hear that a lot. Yes, sir. No, you do. <laughs> Don't be a doubting Thomas. That misses the point of the whole scripture. Thomas needed to see to believe. But that needing to see was authentic and genuine. Now, Jesus said, blessed are those who... who believe even if they have not seen but Thomas wasn't putting himself against God like you hear a whole lot of times when people say if I can only see it all believe it what they're really saying is I don't want to believe it and I know I'm not going to see it so I'm off the hook but that's not what Thomas was saying Thomas was saying, if I see, I will believe. That's what he was saying. Now it's better, even if you don't see, to believe. But the point of the story is that Christ came to him and showed himself to Thomas. The Lord knew what Thomas needed. And he met the need. 
The Lord knew what Thomas needed, and he met the need. Because Thomas wanted to believe, Thomas knew the Lord, had a hard time believing that he rose from the dead. Thomas wanted the truth. That's what was behind his saying, I have to see it to believe it. But if I do see it, I will believe. And that indicates a heart that wanted to see the truth. So it's actually a very, very positive gospel reading. It's not the finger wagging, don't be a doubting Thomas. It's not shaming. It's not scolding. It's not criticizing. What it is, it's the recognition of who Thomas was, his makeup and his character, and the Lord meeting the request. So it's very positive in that sense. And it's very affirming in this way, is the Lord will meet our needs. I've had people come up to me and say, I want to believe, but I'm just having such a hard time believing. And I'll ask, do you want to encounter Christ? Do you want to meet him? They go, yeah. I said, okay, then we're going to pray, and you're going to encounter Christ. How do I know that? How can I say that with that assurance? Because he did it to Thomas, that's why. And you know what happens every single time? In some way or another, they encounter Christ. <clears throat> there was a young man, I'm going to call him George, and this is when I was doing Ionian Village, and George had a, had a hard life came from an abusive background, this and that, not many connections with people. And when you come from a background like that, it's very hard to trust. If you've been betrayed by people, especially when you're young, it's very hard to trust people you see. And if it's hard to trust people you see, it's even harder to trust God who you can't see. That's the way it is. That's elementary psychology, especially with children. And But I love this kid. I just love this kid. My heart went out to him. I could kind of read what was going on. And we established a little connection. And after the trip was, towards the end of the trip, we always, we went from small village on the west side of Greece to Athens. And we spent the last four days in Athens. It's crazy. You got, you got 80 kids and you're all managing them in a hotel. But it was a whole <coughs> lot of fun. And we would always stop at historical places on the way to Athens. So we would stop at Olympia, that kind of thing. And we stopped at a, at a monastery called Osios Lukas, the Honorable Luke. The day before we left, it's always a big day and packing the stuff and loading the buses and the whole nine yards. At about 11 at night, I hear a knock on my door. The, uh, the priest lived in, in a bungalow. I was there with my wife. And, and I hear a knock on the door, and I go to the door, and it's Matthew. He says, Matthew comes up to me, and he says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. So we took a walk down the road, and he goes, I don't believe in God. I said, okay. I said, if God were real, would you believe in him? He goes, well, yeah, if he's real, I believe in him, but I don't believe in God. I said, if God were to show himself to you, would you believe in him? He says, yeah, I would. This was the Thomas scenario. That's what I call it, the Thomas scenario. I said, okay, well, how about this? How about me and you pray and and we'll ask God to show himself to you. And he said, how can I pray to somebody I don't believe in? I thought, this, this kid is smart. He's good. He's really good. I said, okay, that's fair. I said, how about this? How about if I pray and you just stand here? Would that be okay? He says, yeah, that'll be okay. And so we did. 
and I prayed the most rock bottom simple prayer I could think of. Dear Jesus, please show yourself to, I'm going to call him George. You might see this but one. But you day. called him Matthew. Pardon me? But then you called him Matthew. Oh, well, it's George. <laughs> I gave it away. <laughs> anyway, we're going to call him George. And, and the most simple rock bottom prayer I could think of. And he said, okay. So he went to bed and I went to bed. I mentioned that one of the places we stop at was a monastery called Osios Lutas, the Venerable Luth. This is a holy monastery. The monks there are holy monks. They just are. And I've learned subsequently after this first experience, this was my first experience there, that the people who had the hardest times finding Christ, connecting with Christ, and it's usually because of trauma in their, in their history, would always find him there. It got to the point where I wouldn't even worry about it because I knew the miracle would happen there. And it always did. So, they have beautiful icons at Osios Lucas. That's kind of the center of the renewal of, of Byzantine iconography after the collapse of the Ottoman oppression. And it's also one of the few monasteries where they let you take pictures inside the chapel. Right, so all the kids go with their camera and they run up to the chapel and they start taking pictures. Everybody does. And I'd been there before, so I thought, well, I'm going to skip the chapel. I'm just going to kind of hang out and talk to people. I hear this scream, this scream. And I look up at the chapel, and George is running out. And, you know, I remembered the prayer, and I thought, something happened. And he runs by me, and I grab him. And he's all upset. And all, of course, if you've dealt with kids, if one kid gets upset, they all get upset. <laughs> all right? So I pulled him off into this little coat room. I said, come on, we're going to talk. And I just pulled him. I put him in the coat room. I said, what happened? He said, with his camera, remember, he's a really smart kid. This was a while back. He's not a kid anymore. But he was a really smart kid. He said, every time I was taking pictures in the chapel and my camera went to the relics of the saint, my camera jammed. And he did it again and again and again. And he tested it. It happened every single time. This was his first encounter with the living God. It really was. And I knew it. I could sense it. I could see it. I also saw he would get three more. He was going to get three more. And I told him, I said, this is your first. You're going to get two more <coughs> in the next year. You watch. Sometimes you know this and you tell people this. But Father, it's, it's just a camera jamming. No. It's the Lord speaking and revealing himself incrementally to George in the same way that he revealed himself to Thomas. The Lord desires our salvation. Understand that. He desires our salvation. Anyone who needs to see him will see him. You want, you want the Lord to come to you, you draw closer to him. That's what George did when he knocked on my door. I understood that. He was really seeking Christ. And the prayer, I tell you, enabled that to happen. Because the Lord desires George's salvation too. Just like he desired Thomas's when he showed his hands and his side to Thomas. And just as he desires 
Mars. That's clear, right? It's profound. It's profound. We can rationalize it away. But I'm not interested in defending unbelief. What I'm interested in explaining is that when there is a desire for truth, when there is a desire to believe, the power of God towards us is immeasurable. We just, we just got done with Pascha, the death and resurrection. Understand, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is very important, understand that there is nothing more that God himself, that Christ himself can do to bring us into the kingdom. All the barriers have been removed. The, every barrier has been removed. The only thing left is, is to turn our hearts to him, like Thomas, like my friend George, because that turning of the heart is what compels the self-revelation of Christ to us. That's what the lesson of Thomas is, which is replicated in the story that I told you about George. Be confident in the Lord's love for you. <clears throat> Approach the throne of grace, it says in Holy Scripture, and do it, test it, test it. Like, like Thomas did, approach the throne of grace boldly. Because as, as James says, if you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. Then, then, salvation becomes, I'm going to use a couple of $35 theological words, concrete, existential. In other words, it's real. It's real. Life itself takes on a sacred dimension. And we begin to comprehend and live and understand what it means to become sons of the living God. Just like Thomas, just like George. Christ is risen. George is risen. Please rise.